Hello everyone, welcome to our second session today. Uh, a little change to our original plan. The first presentation will be held by Natalia Beckham. I hope she's with us already. Uh, this will be an online presentation. Maybe you should speak up a little bit. Okay. Uh, Fortunately for all of us, I didn't give another presentation and this is my normal voice. So I will try to do my best, but it's not really important to be louder. So, um, hello. Hello, Natalia. I hope you hear and maybe see us. Hi, I can see you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, it's okay for you then. I think you can just start. Right. And now I um, aim to speak for 20 minutes, right? Yeah, exactly. I have here my timer just, um, just in case. And if the connection breaks or if you can't hear me properly, please interrupt and, and let me know. All right. Thank you. Um, and good afternoon again and greetings from Helsinki. Um, <laughs> This has been very fruitful today's for me, and I'm very much grateful to the workshop organizers to be able to join um, online. Um, and my own theme on the my own take on the theme of the workshop comes from literary studies. Um, I'm currently working on a book project on the utopian imagination in Central Eastern Europe after 1991 from a world literary perspective. And so I'll be talking uh, about utopia from this angle. And um, I'll make three points in this talk, um, rather schematic ones, but I think uh, there is a lot in each of them to unpack in relation to the theme of the, of the workshop. And the first point I would like to make is in uh, connection to Utopia and Central Eastern Europe. Um, so this would be probably preaching to the choir, but the first observation I'll make is that um, Utopia at the moment is one of the key theoretical and artistic concerns of our time. From the study of futurity and the search for real utopias in sociology <laughs> to the boom in fantastic, apocalyptic and dystopian fiction, utopia in all its forms is intrinsic to how um, our age thinks the present and beyond. On the other hand, um, Across disciplines, this sustained concern with the future is often expressed as an epistemic or formal crisis. Most, most notably, it is a diagnosis of uh, our imagination of the future being in crisis. And this is a consistent diagnosis across the years. I've referenced a few works that speak precisely about crisis of imagination. So a third point to make here, I think, is that so a mediation between these two extremes, looking at the shape utopian imagination currently takes in the post-Soviet regions of Europe, would be beneficial. And um, the reasons for it, I, I think, why in the specific historical situation um, that this sociocultural space um, has, um, the Soviet Sphere um, is the space in which utopia was said to have been actualized, or at least to have been achievable in the near future, the so-called radiant future. The collapse of the Soviet Union in the 1990s um, had two brief consequences. A sense of the end of all utopias or of the achievement of a particular alternative future such as um, joining the affluent and democratic West, for example. But soon, social, economic, and ecological catastrophes exposed this longing for the end of utopias as itself the biggest utopia of them all, as a Ukrainian writer Yurko Prohasko would diagnose in the year 2020. So to me, it seems that in this world literary region, we have a unique historical situation. It's, this situation is structured, um, first of all, by a distrust towards future, official future-making projects. It is structured by a destruction of future by war. 
as well as by the lived experience of achieving an alternative future, if you will. So how does all this combine in, in the search for a better future world? And how do the cultural and social effects of such previously unimaginable thing as Soviet communism coming to an end? How does the experience of this end influence the so-called crisis of imagination when it comes to the system of late capitalism? And here I'd like you to recall that famous dictum attributed to Frederick James and Oslava Žižek that it is easier to imagine the end of the world and the end of capitalism. And we, well, we've lived through one particular end of seemingly unchangeable uh, system. So I won't go into examples at this point, uh, but it is my um, tentative observation that um, after 1990s, the mainstream references to utopia in the region may be negative. As uh, one of the talks in the previous panels suggested, there is a certain skepticism and the treatment of utopia as ideologies or ideology. So utopia in this region offer, often appears as an accusation that someone, someone's future visions run too close to the revival either of the imperial projects of the past or of the past national glories. But at the same time, indirectly, without being named so, this utopian um, desire for a better world uh, informs and structures social imaginary of the future. And this, I think, is um, you can make the observation based on um, analysis of how literary works um, are structured in the region. But before I discuss example, Examples, I think it is necessarily also for me to say in which sense I use uh, the category of utopia. And I um, particularly focus on utopia as a philosophical category, following Abensur and Levitas. Um, in this abstract sense, the utopia is a desire for a better future, for a different, better way of being. It is that which, which educates desire. And in a rigorous philosophical sense, this utopia cannot be expressed in concrete, that is substantive, um, social, political, or aesthetic terms, which means it cannot describe an ideal place or a perfect future society, because such descriptions will be inevitably rooted in the existing discourses and will reproduce existing limitations. According to, to China Mievel, for example, if we take utopia seriously as a total reshaping, its scale means that we can't think it from this side, right? We can't imagine what it would be like. Um, so if we'd like to trace this particular manifestation of utopia, we will need to look beyond the level of content and focus on the form and on the underlying structures of meaning. And um, here, with the underlying structures of meaning, I link uh, Frederick Jameson's development of this uh, trajectory of utopian thinking. Um, a good example of how utopia educates its readers, I think, could be this famous refusal to choose between two readily available options, a good place or non-existent place. Instead of accepting this binary choice, a utopian procedure demonstrates that the whole structure may be unnecessary in the first place. According to Frederick Jameson, um, utopian function lies in such gesture of negation. Utopia doesn't help us to imagine a better future. It doesn't help us to uh, come up with a concrete solution to the existing problems, but it reveals, and I quote Jameson, it reveals the ideological closure of the system in which we are somehow trapped and confined to such a degree that we simply cannot imagine an alternative. And uh, more precisely, this is I have on the slide, uh, this summary, more precisely, utopia is an operation of negative dialectic. It doesn't unite the two opposites in some impossible synthesis, but it retains both terms in their negation of each other and thus allows to grasp the moment of truth 
uh, of each term. Um, the utopian procedure understood semiotically then is a double negation. And it reveals limitations of the status quo, it reveals limitations of the existing alternatives um, and the structures of thought that block us from thinking in radically new ways about the future. Um, this, of course, is only one particular understanding of utopia, but I think um, in the context of um, literary works, where usually only the content is discussed, I think it is important to stress this particular take on utopia. And now um, to link this um, utopian angle uh, to the focus of the workshop on democracy, um, I've, um, I think I could say that um, based on my observations, democracy way more explicitly than utopia figures as one of the key concerns of public debate. In Central Eastern Europe and in my case study for today's talk in contemporary Ukraine. Um, but democracy um, is anything but a straightforward topic as I think we've learned in the course of this workshop. Um, let me give you an anecdotal example, which you perhaps uh, also are familiar with already. Um, before Volodymyr, Volodymyr Zelensky became the president of Ukraine, he was um, a stand-up comedian and an actor. And his well-known TV series, Servant of the People, um, had such a good premise that made it so popular. You know, a representative of the ordinary people is elected president. The actual ordinary people and not, for example, business elites um, are represented in the state governance in a truly democratic fashion. Um, but ironically, when Zelensky actually won the presidential elections in uh, 2019, the country's opinion became extremely divided. Many didn't go to vote at all. Many were left very bitter about the stupidity of fellow citizens who could fall prey to such straightforward populism. And heated social media discussions continue to this day um, whether democracy is such a great organizing principle for politics. Because what if the majority of demos are fools? What if, as it actually happens, um, the majority of the population can be successfully manipulated? And this conversation carries on also directly and indirectly, indirectly in literary works. Uh, in the year 2020, Sergei Jadan, one of the hugely influential writers and cultural figures, was considering what, are the what is the future of Ukraine, say, after the Russian-Ukrainian war. And he was, of course, still thinking of the one started in 2014. Um, and that future inevitably uh, had to be discussed in, in terms of democratic choices, in terms of political elections. Um, Jadan observes that somehow precisely this question of choice and of the inevitable responsibility for one's choice is a particularly urgent and a painful one in our country lately. Sometimes one has the impression that choosing the future for a country, we do so not because we care for someone, and he means future generations, but out of vengeance locking ourselves into a corner only to then bravely fight to get out of that corner. And at the same time, as this dissatisfaction with the existing structure of democracy um, exists, there is, um, there is this fight for democracy, however it is conceived, because if you think, um, what was the catalyst for uh, major popular uprisings in Ukraine in 2004 and directly in 2013? It was a limitation of democratic elections, right, in 2004, and it was um, an increasing authoritarian tendencies in the government in 2013. So there is this kind of paradox where people complain about democratic uh, system as it is um, arranged, but also continue fighting for it. Um, I think I will not um, go into further details here. I still was 
wanted to consider this democratic paradox. But I will uh, move to the third point um, and the final section of my talk, uh, where I would like to unite then the utopic and democratic concerns with the help of a short case study from contemporary Ukrainian fiction. Um, and I look at fiction these days uh, because I think in times of social crisis, literature renews its role as a site of articulation and discussion of what it means to be a certain kind of society. And in times of war, moreover, um, the very possibility of society's future is suspended, if not destroyed. And this has profound um, effect on public discourse, as well as on the literary discourse, because the future is suspended, but at the same time, war brings about um, absolutely urgent, persistent questions about the future. When will it end? How can it end? And how do we live after? Um, if there is no visible answer to the combination of these questions, if the war drags out into a new routine and ceases to be a state of exception, what kind of temporality organizes a society without the future? There is, of course, that extreme one of the here and now of basic daily survival. Um, but beyond this immediate daily level, when the state of exception becomes a routine, I think uh, that the absent future becomes substituted by utopia. The absent social future is then translated into utopia. And in a sense, um, in, in, in this following sense that I've now also summarized on the slide, the future is open-ended, suspended, destroyed. And this open-endedness combines with a militant desire to achieve a better future, however impossible or unrealistic it may seem, right? So the destruction of the future, it does not lead to apathy, to uh, um, inaction, but it does generate this forward um, looking action towards something that seems impossible at the moment. And this I think is kind of a utopian temporality if, if there is one. And to remind you of that operation of the double negation I mentioned earlier, uh, drawing on James, Jameson, um, I think that operation captures um, this desire because it refuses the available options that are not satisfactory. And as an example of what I mean, I'd like to quote here um, an imaginary interaction Ursula Le Guin had uh, cited in one of her essays on Utopia. Um, she writes, I am offered uh, the grand inquisitor's choice. Will you choose freedom without happiness or happiness without freedom? The only answer one can make, I think, is no. So the syntactic and semantic model of this answer is, to my mind, a utopian operation in a nutshell. And now, um, having just a few minutes left, um, I would like to exemplify this utopian operation with the help uh, of a literary text. Um, Ivan Semesiuk's humorous, brutal, and uncompromising satire called Farshutka. And this text uh, grapples with the absurdity of the Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2014. Um, in the text, the small bus called called Farshutka, um, full of different social types and a talking baboon, which Semesiuk drew himself on these pictures here. Uh, this small bus finds itself in the middle of an epic battle with propaganda cliches and magical debris flying from the self-imploding Russia. The action unfolds in the course of a fateful day, uh, which according to Bhagavad Gita, the sacred text of Hinduism um, is called the day of Brahma. And during this day, every living entity is annihilated and unmanifest because the day changes into the night. The annihilation apparently starts with Russia, uh, which decides to use this fateful moment 
and destroyed in the process as much of the world as possible with the literal pieces of its own country and its people. So Samusu goes into this uh, strange allegories and, and draws on very different uh, mythologies to construct the sense of absurdity that this war um, brings about. And uh, published in 2016, this text uh, faced the binary non-choice Ukraine had at the time and still has now between engaging in what the majority would think is a futile resistance to Russia or surrendering right away. Um, faced with this non-choice for a very long time, um, the Ukraine's political, social, and cultural debates have had some, um, I guess, ways of trying to think through it. And Fashutka, for example, um, cuts through the ideological variations on this dilemma and exposes its bare bones. It exposes this particular ideological closure, either or of uh, bad options. Um, in the text, time and again, someone uh, from the bus, for example, would explain their predicament, saying, like Ostav Bishnu, um, who was talking, saying, in principle, we are fucked. Nothing to do about it. Resistance is futile. Just lie down and die because everything was determined long ago, decided and carved into the sacred stone. The universe has to collapse whether we want it or not, and Ukraine will go out with it. And at the same time, the whole text is about resisting and fighting back. So whenever any other character questions the point of this resistance, uh, they immediately are reminded that all these century-old scribblings must not influence their work. The book, at the same time as it says this, the book insists that changing the course of history is well within our powers, even if it's Maha history, as Sanskrit would have it. And so for every fatalistic prophecy, uh, such as the one from Bhagavad Gita, um, Fashutka replies with a different one from the literary history, such as the Ukrainian classics, Boritisya Poboratum. And now I'm approaching the conclusion. Um, in the end of the book, the bus does win. It somehow manages to stop uh, the end of the world and the annihilation by Russia. Um, and you think this is a happy end. But as we know, utopian desire, utopian movement cannot be arrested, right? Because it disintegrates into totalitarian um, figurations. And so... To keep this perpetually unresolved utopian attention, Farshutka also resists the formal imperatives of narrative closure. The bus crew sits down to eat and relax, but this is just a temporary pause. They also say they must go to Kyiv as soon as they finish the picnic because the corrupt state institutions are not going to change themselves. And the victory that they have supposedly achieved is linguistically ambiguous in the best traditions of Thomas More's uh, neologism. One of the characters asks, is it a victory or a betrayal? Vakarchuk, grown from the flower bushes. It's both, Slavko. It's victrayal, Yuhimenko replied. Um, you must remember that this is a satire, so it, can, it, it has found the form in which to grapple with these impossible questions. Um, so to conclude, uh, I think, I'll just stress how texts like Farshutka and their form, their innovative form, how they draw attention to a particular satirical and indirect figuration of utopia in contemporary Ukrainian literature. Understood in a formal way, such utopia doesn't offer a vision of a future to be read in democratic or in other terms, but what it does is offer a crucial uh, revelation that there is nothing natural or necessary about the current situation. There is nothing immutable and set in stone in different analytical predictions about the social world, uh, political trajectories, and possibilities for change. The future can be different from what, it, what its contemporary projections um, say, but it would require an inhuman amount of dedication and work. And it is significant, I think, that Farshutka um, 
entrust this task of bringing about a better future to a heterogeneous group composed of different social strata of humans, animals, and demigods, and their unlikely cooperation, thus tying the utopian desire back again to a desire for an ideal a democratic uh, society. And I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Would be the best if you had some minutes pressing questions about this presentation because uh, technically I think it would be more. Oh, it's uh, it's more, mostly just comments uh, to add uh, to Natalia's uh, things. It's just amusing that I, as a Ukrainian, kind of uh, also thought about. Well, first of all, the the quote. I'm going to start from the end. The quote about the victory or betrayal. It's just a it's a very um, prominent kind of meta narrative amongst Ukrainians. It's it's a it's this lens through which uh, we most uh, often. Uh, perceive uh, uh, like all sorts of political like whatever news we're discussing. This is like this the, the, this du dual lens. It's so prominent that it kind of already is becoming memeified in the, in the social media. Uh, but uh, um, it just struck me how this uh, seemingly kind of innocuous quote just has this like it's, it's much more imbued with the. Uh, with context, if, if you know if you know the, the, about the, this uh, this duality and how prevalent it is in um, Ukrainian political discussion, and then uh, the, the, the short comment about the the servants of the people and the, the whole phenomenon of how this uh, this uh, populist series um, uh, managed to it's it's just a, the particularly striking uh, thing about it was that uh, um, I remember. Some some sort of statistic about Ukraine being uh, uh, around, actually, I think it was 2019 or something like this. Um, that Ukraine was like the lowest, the, the country with the lowest um, levels of trust in government, and that it's something something about like nine uh, percent of people who like really like really trust trust in the government and there's just all sorts of uh, um, uh, authority structures, and uh, the fact that. Uh, this has uh, this 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 really really simple uh, populist kind of propaganda, uh, which was not actually about the democracy super like that much, because one of the uh, more famous scenes there was uh, this this teacher who becomes president, plays Lensky, uh, imagining how he uh, like, hates the the corrupt horrible parliamentarians so much that he just shoots them very brutally. There was a, there was a scene that was play, uh, played up for a comedic effect, obviously, but uh, th this is one of the most famous and celebrated uh, uh, scenes in there, which people really kind of related to, which is uh, also a very interesting question as to what, do, what does it say about Ukrainians and, uh, and Ukrainians, especially when they're electing uh, people, like why would you want to elect people who you want to kill? <laughs> but um, um, this, uh, so 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 the, the 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 amount of effect it had on such a disillusioned country is uh, was fascinating. I'm pretty sure that there should be some sort of research on like how how because the the the, the numbers of the. the the, for, both for the the servant of the people party and Zelensky, those was landslide victory it was it was phenomenal. Since Ukrainians actually and Natalia actually uh, mentioned this, we mostly kind of uh, we vote with vengeance. We vote against more more often than we vote for. Uh, this was uh, um, unprecedented, I would say, uh, for, uh, for for quite a while in, in in modern Ukrainian history. So yeah, that's that's just some of the additional comments I wanted to add. Um, yeah, thank you. Next question slash remark. <laughs> I'm Monica Barr, and uh, my question actually relates to uh, the images that you were showing us. Um, are, are they drawn from the book? Because I think that when we think of utopia, still we think of the written word, whether this is um, a piece of poetical thought or whether this is literary fiction, but here we see utopias visualized, so that I guess they are not just uh, illustrations. They have they, they have a central message, and perhaps you could comment on that. Uh, I, I just 
want to underline this actually. I really loved the, the ships, and I also uh, I wanted to ask more about that because it was so so very powerful. And I was curious about its connection to uh, to to the presentation. But I hope there are some uh, other questions as well. Yes. <clears throat> Uh, hello, Natalia. This is Joy. Um, five condition overcome that very peculiarly resonates with the uh, with the last line of the of the play I was talking about yesterday, which is "Ember to Gishbiz, but these men you shall strive and have faith." So that's very interesting. We have in common with Hungary and the Ukraine. And I have a question about Farshutka. One is that, is it available in English? Because it seems fascinating to me. And the second, if whether you could reflect on the on the cover, because that was very interesting, partly Latin, partly totally Ukrainian. Uh, I was very much interested what was that, what's that all about. Thank you for your presentation. Okay. Uh I think we have some questions and uh, remarks, so if you wish, you, you can start to answer them. Yes, I uh, thanks so much for the comments. Um, I think back to the first to the first uh, reflections. I think I just want to to highlight the last sentence in Ranciere's observation about um, democracy here on the slide that I didn't go through. Um, that well, well, we have in fact are called democracies, but in fact they are oligarchic governments because the the power belongs to a few people or groups that are elected, and the system reduces democratic action only to the election process. So I think in Ukraine's case, for uh, particularly um, visible this situation that uh, people try to influence um, social future on the whole only through these elections. And then there is a lot of uh, different sentiments and uh, and resentments put into this. And there's a lot of kind of heated discussion when it comes to elections. Uh, but um, uh, when it comes to art, uh, the pictures I, I showed, um, so uh, Ivan Samisyuk is an artist himself and he's done a lot um, of things, uh, but the ones that I mostly showed are by Katerina Kosyanenko, and they are not related to Farshutka, but they are uh, nevertheless uh, part of this very interesting project I was following, um, where other Ukrainian writers participated. Uh, Kosyanenko, Kosyanenko's paintings uh, were used as illustrations to works of fiction uh, published in the recent years, and the, 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 the project was called um, Paintings That Became Books. Sergei Jadan, for example, participated in that project and uh, other Ukrainian poets. So there is then uh, the dialogue between the paintings of Kosyanenko and uh, certain literary texts, and they are published um, together. Um, but for me, Kosyanenko's paintings, for example, for this context, they capture the kind of paradoxes that are united um, say in Ukraine's reality, the or in these texts that I consider utopian, even though they are not called utopian, the paradoxes of um, you know I, imagery imagery from uh, religious icons, nineteenth, eighteenth century, and uh, contemporary realities, uh, that uh, contemporary kind of cities that are uh, transposed onto each other. So this layering of contradictory sometimes uh, ideas that are nevertheless united. Um, and through that unity, uh, some sort of a different meaning, or at least a possibility of a different meaning uh, arises. And with uh, Sumesuk, so his text is not translated into English, but um, uh, the cover but specifically here in Parshutka, the combination of languages and registers and mythologies, these are uh, elements of what I would describe as the contemporary genre of Manipian satire. And in my um, work more generally, I am trying to develop a theory of um, how in Central Eastern Europe, um, utopia finds is a genre expression, in, not in the novel, not in the more mainstream uh, types of texts, but specifically in Manipian satire. Fashutka would be one example. There are ones uh, translated into English, um, such as uh, Volodymyr 
Rafienko's Monde Green, for example. So the, there is the whole trajectory of Manipian satire slash utopia in the region since, I think, 1980s, 1990s, and that's something I'm exploring. But thank you for your comments, and thanks for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and if there is no further question, then I think we should proceed with the second presentation. And I think we should proceed with Darina Koyagina's presentation. <sighs> Alex Savile, hello, and uh, thank you for coming to this uh, conference. Uh, uh, this is my this is my first conference. Uh, so if I do seem nervous, that's because I am so. <laughs> um, so um, today I would uh, like to talk uh, about a very uh, peculiar spatial and temporal juncture of world history that allows us a unique opportunity, in my opinion, to study the overlap between the uh, world of fiction and the reality, the fictional and the factual, if you uh, please, uh, and especially when it comes to utopias. And this juncture is located in the newly emerging Soviet Union, primarily in the, 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 the 1920s. And um, the thing is, with a given uh, society combines uh, technological adv advances and a new type of political and social organization, we receive a great op opportunity to study futuristic uh, aspirations of in its intellectual elites. And uh, the end of the 19th uh, and the beginning of the 20th century is a time of uh, significant uh, scientific discoveries in the Western world, which, well, not to the fullest extent, but uh, we're reaching out uh, um, to the uh, developed by the scientists in our Russian empire first, and then within the, when the empire ceased to exist after a very tumultuous and uh, bloody revolutionary processes uh, and the uh, World War I. Uh, a new power emerged in its wake, uh, uh, and uh, some of the scientists, quite, quite a substantial amount of the scientists, were able to adapt to this uh, new system one way or another and re resume their work. Um, um, and on, on the other hand, then there were radical uh, Bolshevik attempts to redesign uh, the societal order and seemingly replace the hierarchy of the old empire, at least that's what the uh, proclaimed... Uh, ideas we're, we're, we're trying to do. Um, in the, his uh, correspondent chapter on uh, the Soviet and Russian uh, utopias, uh, Mikhail Suslov writes uh, in the Palgrave Handbook of Utopian Dystopian Literatures that it became uh, a land of living socialist utopia, the scouting party of humanity. Um, and curiously enough, uh, Bolsheviks and Lenin in particular in writings like the three sources and three compo uh, component parts of Marxism or two utopias and Others, uh, true to critique of utopian socialism by Marx and Engels, were uh, quite rebuffing the, the notion of uh, utopias, uh, which the, this critique was so uh, well known that I've noticed it was brought up several times during this conference alone. Um, and uh, yet it's hard to uh, deny the, the, the truly utopian nature of early Soviet uh, aspirations that permeated virtually all spheres of life, not, not just the, the cultural um, ones, but societal and political as well. Um, and down to the, I would say, even to the futuristic urban planning. So this, the, the utopian spirit was uh, everywhere uh, at once. And one of the best cases through which this can be studied, um, the, the, the relationship, this complex relationship between historical utopian projects and literature of the time uh, that, that would had a utopian futuristic um, like, um, core um, was the phenomenon, phenomenon of the new Soviet man, uh, which was an aspiration to create a new model citizen uh, for the era of communist bliss. Uh, um, uh, Nikolai uh, Kremensov, uh, a um, modern historian of science, uh, of, of Russian, Russian historian of science, um, 
wrote that uh, from its very birth, the Bolsheviks' foundational doctrine, Marxism, has been saturated with ideas about new men, the grave digger of capitalism, the builder of future communist society. It comes as no surprise then that uh, some Russian Marxists greeted uh, with much into the enthusiasm the intense studies and development of various um, biophysical medical uh, technologies for making of the new men pursued by visionary biologists before and particularly after Bolsheviks seized power. Most notorious uh, of these uh, experiments were argu arguably uh, the ones conducted by Russian scientist Ilya Ivanov, that's him, a specialist in artificial uh, insemination and interspecies uh, hybridization who started a project to create a human ape hybrid. Well, this project sounds uh, extremely outlandish and unethical to us now, it was nevertheless supported and approved to, uh, for funding by Bolshevik leaders of high ranking, namely Anatoly Lonchaski, the Commissar of Enlightenment, and uh, Lev Kamenev, a uh, member of the Bureau and deputy head of the Soviet Commissars. Um, and that was not uh, the only attempt so far, although it's just more, more, more interesting one, um, to expand the physiological abilities of humans. The, the list of scientists keenly interested in this topic would include world famous physiologist Ivan Pavlov, who was not. It arguably was not trying to create a new Soviet man precisely, but still, you know, it's very interesting uh, experiments. Um, psychiatrist uh, Vladimir Pechtirev, uh, Nikolai Kaltsov, arguably the most so uh, famous Soviet eugenicist, um, geneticist Yuri Filipchenko, psychologist uh, Georgi Chalpanov, and, uh, and numerous others. Um, but uh, it's not only physiological enhancements that will create a new Soviet man. Uh, since he should also be morally superior in a sense of total devotion to communist ideals. When describing the uh, ideal, uh, describing the communist men of the future in the 1924 uh, book of his um, uh, called uh, Literature and Revolution, Leon Trotsky wrote that he will try to master first the semi-conscious and, the, and then the subconscious processes in, in his own organism. And within necessary limits, he will try to subordinate them to the control of reason and will. Man will make it his purpose to master his own feelings, to raise his instincts to the heights of consciousness, to make them transparent, to extend the buyers uh, of his will into hidden recesses and thereby to raise himself to a new plane, to create a higher social biologic uh, type, and, or if you please, a Superman. The Superman quote, I think, would particularly remind us of a later attempt, a very, very infamous attempts at eugenics. Um, here, uh, Trotsky here underlines the point uh, that mere moral superiority can change such individual almost to the biological extent, which is quite different from the, the, the actual <laughs> biologist trying to enhance a human uh, being. And it is important to note here that um, discussions of new Soviet men and the, the uh, that in the discussions of new Soviet men, the morality and adherence to communist ideals was often postulated as having transformative powers and being uh, crucial for the future communists. The list of people who were writing extensively of their own visions of creating such a progressive men, uh, the new part of the collective, include Lenin, Gorky, Lancharsky, well, and many, many other um, famous uh, the, the part, both party leaders and the in, in intelligentsia. Bolsheviks strive to control biology and basic instincts through the power of conviction in all spheres of life. A good example of that can be found in various initiatives to control the sex drive and sexual behavior amongst the proletariat, which often varied from programmatic documents. Uh, like uh, here we have an excerpt, or excerpt of the 12 sexual commandments of the revolutionary proletariat uh, by Soviet uh, psychologist Aaron Zalkind, which is a fascinating read. Uh, or the works of uh, fiction, this is Alexandra Kalantai, I'm sure you've heard of her, uh, the, the love of worker bees, and then she also had a, a great love, the, the first woman in the Bolshevik government, the most prominent woman in the Bolshevik government, who was often erroneously hailed as a herald of free love and promiscuity amongst young communists, and often she got a lot of flag from, this, from, from Lenin, even though that's, uh, not, not all of his criticism was actually uh, correct, uh, correctly attributed to her. And um, the fictional literature of the time reflected these as, uh, aspirations. For example, physician 
Uh, Fyodor Ilyin uh, published his Valley of New Life four years before Huxley's Brave New World, and the two books have uh, uh, many parallels. Uh, despite advanced technological development, it's primarily the new superior physicality combined with specialized upbringing of the, the lab-grown people of the future that make the valley a truly utopian place. And in both works, these advancements allow the new social order to emerge. And this order where uh, a family has been abolished and everyone serves their purpose as a, as a part of a bigger system sounds awfully familiar to some of the revolutionary Bolshevik ideas, which is interesting since the creators of this supposed uh, city in of future in Elin's book where the American capitalist Queensleys were imposing their own will onto the superhuman race through telepathy and other uh, means of indoctrination. And the question here, of course, uh, can we quantify this individual who fit the mold of the new Soviet men perfectly, but are not governed by communist party? Um, uh, and uh, whether uh, this society can be considered truly utopian if the fictional narrator and narrator ends up fleeing it. And uh, another interesting question about literary depictions of new Soviet men was how widespread it was in literature outside of Soviet Russia, something that modern scholarship of uh, um, early Soviet utopias, unfortunately, does not, does not venture outside of uh, Russian literature often enough. Uh, to explore this question, let us take a brief look at some of the books from the beautiful catastrophes series uh, um, by a Ukrainian Soviet writer, Yuri Smolish, that's, that's him. He was the editor of the Universal Journal, or just simply abbreviated to USH as usual, uh, that was published from uh, 1928 and was one of the main forces behind the, he, he was he was one of the main uh, uh, creative forces behind the, the, sci the, the kind of emergence of uh, science fiction in Soviet Ukraine. Uh, in book one, of the series titled uh, Dr. Helmanescu's Enterprise that was published in uh, 1929, uh, we're introduced uh, to main characters, a protagonist, a young woman, and a very like idealistic Soviet uh, citizen, uh, Yulia uh, Sakhno, uh, who studies agriculture and the antagonist, the renowned um, Romanian Dr. Uh, Helmanescu, who is known for unbelievable results in growing crops in the lens through unknown technologies by, is mysteriously feared by the local, um, by the local uh, populations in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Bessarabia. Um, Dr. Hernanescu fits the mold of a mad scientist in Soviet literature who's often portrayed as using uh, science to serve uh, his own interests or employed by capitalists as opposed to like serving the, the greater good uh, as a scientist should. And at first we are introduced uh, to the wonders of mechanized product, uh, production that doctor shows to Yulia, but she soon finds out that the main secret to doctor's success is, is not that, but it's in fact transforming the bodies of uh, uh, poor uh, Ukrainian labor workers into living, uh, working mindless slaves by replacing their uh, blood with a special liquid. So soon enough, the reader is led to believe that all of the doctor's speeches about innovations are but a cover for him uh, to exploit a common worker, which is a very uh, traditional Soviet view on uh, capitalist enterprise owners. While uh, Yulia initially uh, exposes his unethical practices, uh, he only becomes defeated in later installment of um, what happened next, which was released in 1934, where a group of Soviet scientists attempts to reverse, actually, the experiment results. Here we see uh, an interesting interpretation of the new Soviet man with, uh, that is closer to the Trotsky's ideas of transformation through the sheer morality and adherence to communist virtue. The, here, the scientist who makes truly unique discoveries uh, is not creating superhumans who would then build a perfect society in like, like um, Eileen's uh, new val uh, the, the Valley of New Life, uh, and um, but instead he's making living automatons who can be exploited, and uh, that's about the extent of their function. Uh, with the polarity reversed like this, the, the spirit of the book can almost be kind of turning into a grim dystopian tale about science at um, service of capitalism. But lo and behold, the protagonists of the story, uh, who are like Yulia, are uh, the ones who truly embody the, the idea of this virtuous young communist scientists and activists. And uh, what happened next is particularly heavy 
with glorification of Soviet ideology, um, with all the scientific collective uh, battling the evil doctor, uh, and they're being presented as practically this poster perfect individual straight from the uh, descriptions of uh, like straight from the uh, the Soviet agitprom, uh, which is one of the reasons why the late, later novel was uh, that actually kind of presents this utopia sort of utopian futuristic vision of a Soviet scientist, uh, the very virtuous um, and idealistic communist, uh, uh, has not been as popular amongst the modern readers uh, of the of the of classical Ukrainian science fiction, unlike the the the, 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 the first book. Interestingly enough, Smolich in general is almost completely ignored by Ukrainian readers and scholars uh, during the, the modern time for um, allegedly being quite a prolific NKVD informant, which the debate is still out on that one, the, the, um, and uh, um, which along with the politically correct message in it, which we can especially see in the uh, What Happened Next um, and other his many other works, uh, saved his works from being banned in the Union like many other utopias and, and science fiction works. The idealistic version of the new Soviet men um, although was losing ground pretty quickly and not in the literature, um, not only in the literature, um, uh, where um, since a, a lot of many revolutionary young, young writers after the um, 1920s became either oppressed, exiled, or simply disillusioned, uh, but also in science. By the mid-1930s, uh, the experiments of, of field, uh, in fields of improving humans bio, uh, biologically, particularly in the spheres of uh, genetics and eugenics, were effectively banned. When Soviet uh, science began suffering from the actions of uh, Trofim Lysenko, arguably one of the most uh, influential pseudoscientists throughout Soviet history, and the advance, uh, quite beloved by Stalin, <laughs> and the advance of Lysenkoism is not the only instance of stifling progress and, uh, by extension, the initial utopian aspirations of Bolsheviks. If we are to think of the 1920s from the position of balance, of an aim to build an idea communist society, and terror that was always at heart of Soviet utopia, um, and was the and was the means to realize these aspirations. Then, after uh, the, the 1920s, uh, and well, during them, kind of, but after uh, it was especially prevalent, the terror has uh, tipped the, the, the this this balance um, quite a lot. And utopian slogans and propagandist rhetoric would become substantially divorced from the prevailing public mood, and uh, particularly amongst intelligentsia and um, the disillusionments among some of the even most passionate revolutionaries uh, became pronounced and utopian projects in all spheres of life from futuristic urban planning to artistic uh, um, endeavors had no place in the system that was so much focused on exterminating the so-called internal enemy and eating a solo tail, essentially. So this, the new Soviet man has suffered the same fate. While the idea of creating ideal Soviet citizens never really died off in Soviet propaganda, we can certainly say that it has lost um, its utopian aspirations and kind of became void in the end. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for your attention. Presentation, and I think uh, we should continue with the third presentation. Oh. And we are referring to contemporary literature. <laughs> yes. I just can't go on. Okay. 
I can call them if you want, but I don't know what Okay, it's fine. Okay. I have just yeah. more visual. Okay, yeah. so may I start? Yes, of okay. course. Okay, yeah. Good afternoon, dear colleagues, and welcome, welcome to my presentation. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to express my deepest condolences for the loss of so many lives by the dead earthquakes in Turkey uh, that claimed more than 50,000 lives. Uh, I, am, I am a Mary Curie Fellow at the Institute of Advanced Study at the University of Warwick uh, in the Department of English and Comparative Literary Studies currently. And I would like to start off by again by extending my gratitude to the workshop organizers Jolt and Eva and Darina and other distinguished members of the Institute and the University who have made this timely and significant event possible. The title of my rather informative and introductory talk today is Utopia, Dystopia and Democratic Discourse in Contemporary Tur Turkish Literature, which I hope will be interesting for you. Today, I would like to offer various insight into portrayals of Utopia and Dystopia in contemporary Turkey, particularly literary works that are related to the concepts of utopia, dystopia, and democratic discourse. For those who may not know, like Turkey has changed its name to Turkey official now, so the country's name is Turkey, which may be difficult to pronounce for the international audience. In the, in the first part of my talk, I will first give an insight into utopian and dystopian fiction and relevant scholarship in the country to give an overview of the scholarly interest in the country. In the second part, as you see in the slide here, I will discuss how democratic discourse may be a crucial functioning tool engendering a drastic transformation in the face of a utopian society in initial solidarity as manifested in the Turkish order Zülfü Livaneli's critical dystopia, The Last Island or Sonata in Turkish. And this book has been translated into English. Now I think it was published in the US and it's going to be published in the UK as well in English. If you have any questions or comments, I'm more than happy to respond to as much as possible in the Q&A session. Under the influence of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen the growing interest both in Anglophone and Anglophone world and Turkey in research fields such as speculative fiction, the Anthropocene, and environmental humanities. Additionally, we have also seen an emphasis on decolonization, decolonizing the minds, the canon, and the curricula as a result of the increasing interest in non-Anglophone world, literatures, and cultures as we have been seeing in the, in the last two days. These recent developments have led me to contemplate utopian and dystopian narratives in contemporary Turkey, and further motivated me to maintain my current project at Warwick, which is work in progress. Even though a greater interest has arisen, there are still obstacles uh, that are generally stemming from a lack of sufficient translations of relevant primary and secondary sources of utopian and dystopian fiction. The quantity of relevant sources has increased tremendously, but the lack of sufficient translations poses a big obstacle in this regard. Because there does not exist a well-established tradition, this also causes a problem in the translation of these works. Unless the translator does not have a good command of the field, translation may be highly misleading as well. This problem of translation also prevents Turkish SF, Turkish Utopian and Dystopian Literature, from having an international audience unless the authors are translated. Even though we have authors such as Orhan Pamuk, Elif Shafak, Yashar Kemal, Zülfü Livaneli, or Ahmet Hamdi Tambunar, as you see here on the slide, who deal with such themes as utopia, solidarity, common good, freedom, and democracy, translated into English or other languages, this is still not at the desired level. However, we have seen also major positive developments in terms of the promotion of the field in the country, both academic and non-academic. To start with, Patskal or Sıcakkafa in Turkish, directed by Mert Baykal and Umur Turagay, was released on Netflix on the 2nd of December last year. This TV series based on Afshin Kum's novel Sıcakkafa or Hatskal with the same title that was published in 2016, may be labeled as the first, which is my opinion, dystopian TV series in the country. Through its unique illustration, it draws particular attention to pandemic control, power use and misuse, manipulation, freedom, democratic discourse and hope. It is also special because it was set in Istanbul. So that is kind of the, I think the first series of, it, of its nature. So continue. 
The International Dystopia Film Festival, of which I was the academic advisor for the first one, was organized by the film director Hatice Aşkın and sponsored by the Turkish Minister of Culture and Tourism, General Director of Cinema. You may wonder why Turkish government is, uh, or was funding, you know, such a project called Dystopia. We may discuss, but it was really important that you know they funded, especially the ministry funded such a project, because I mean I had a huge talk with the director and she didn't believe if she could get the funding, but then I think she was persistent enough, so it worked out. So in the first festival, which brought distinguished actors and some public celebrities together, there were dystopian film and script contests. Additionally, there were also some academic sections in which we discussed the concepts of utopia, democracy, future ideal society, and hope. So all the thoughts were, like, I mean, some of the thoughts were in Turkish and some were translated. So also uh, Professor Clays also gave a very important talk and other colleagues as well. Uh, so I think it was aimed for the general audience more. So we had to use a specific type of jargon, you know, we had to avoid like using academic jargon. This was followed by another relevant event, you know, the Dystopia Sound Art Festival organized in Istanbul, which hosted artists from over 16 countries that through their creative practices expressed their views of social and political structures, presented as alternatives to the experienced reality as stated in the call for paper. The private theater company, Tatbikat Sahnes in Ankara, established by Erdal Beşikçoğlu, performed George Orwell's dystopian novella Animal Farm in Turkish in 2012, in addition to their performance of Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451 in 2020. Erdal Beşikçoğlu is a very like famous figure in Turkey, and he established this theater first in Ankara and then moved to Istanbul, and then they're also supporting more independent productions, but also hosting lots of like celebrities, so quite significant. And they are also putting like numerous plays on stage that are critical of the current uh, order. Another theater company, Aysa Produksiyon Tiyatrosu, put Orwell's 1984 on the stage with the title 1984 Büyük Gözaltı in Istanbul and across the country in 2018 and 2019. These theatrical adaptations of those cult texts made the audience question the portrayal of utopia and dystopia, social order, and democratic discourse in these fictional worlds, which probably found contextual, historical, and political implications and reflections from the socio-political contextual conjuncture. I mean, especially this one was successful, so I had the chance to watch all these like uh, productions in Ankara and then Istanbul as well. I mean, obviously 1984 was not made for stage, so in that like, it was kind of quite intensive like production. And then because this sector is so popular, uh, you know, there were so many audiences just because of the name. And then later on, there were interesting discussions, I think, from the audience that I also I was eavesdropping. Furthermore, numerous departments such as English language and literature, philosophy, sociology, history, communication, architecture, urban planning, media and political science, at Turkish universities have utopia, dystopia related courses or issues which closely relate to democracy, freedom, and democratic society in their undergraduate and graduate curricula, which demonstrates the broad and interdisciplinary interests that exist at many Turkish universities as well as the transformative potential involved. I hope I have given sufficient insight into what kind of relevant scholarship exists in the country. Now I would like to briefly talk about utopian and dystopian narratives in the country. These narratives have been illustrated more frequently in literature as compared to audiovisual media, although screen adaptations and productions have also increased in quantity and quality. Literary utopias especially flourished in 19th century under the profound influence of westernization dreams and the period social, political, historical conditions. Utopian thinking further developed, especially under the influence of the foundation of the Republic of Turkey in 1923, and the ensuing reforms introduced by the founding figure, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. These reforms included, but were not limited to, the abolition of the Caliphate in 1924, the official acceptance of the Latin alphabet in 1928, the establishment of the Turkish language institution in 1932, the regulation of dressing in 1934, and granting women the political right to elect and to be elected in 1934 on the 5th of December. The decade of the 1930s and the following decades 
witness the emergence and development of literary works with strong utopian undertones. In these works, we see various themes and issues such as religious concerns, alternative social and political systems, inequality, corruption, and other problematic aspects of the social order. Texts such as Ahmet Aoulou's In the Land of the Free Man, here as you see, Shevket Süreyya Aydemir's If the Land Wakes Up, and Latifi Tekin's The Garden of Forgetting are among the exemplary representative texts after the Declaration of the Republic. On the other hand, texts with an anti-utopian or dystopian tendency were also inspired and influenced by significant historical and political events, such as military coups, especially the September 12, 1980 coup d'etat, economic crises, and other social problems. The 1980s stand out as significant for the development of the genre of utopian and dystopian fiction, which Sartre explains as follows. The revitalization of the political atmosphere after the 1980s, intense interest in philosophy and history, research into socialist theory, the increased interest in ecology and feminism, have caused the concept of utopia and dystopia to be analyzed among the intellectuals, unquote. Literary works with a dystopian tendency in Turkish literature include texts such as Junaid R.J. Rex Coup d'etat, Zühtü Bayar's Fake Civilization or Artificial Civiliz- Civilization, Zülfü Livaneli's The Last Island, Ayşe Kulin's Captured Son or Captive Son from 2015, which has numerous references to the Gezi Park protest in Istanbul in 2013, this, this text here, and domestic violence against women in the country, Afshin Kum's Sıcak Kafa or Hat, Hat Skull, and Oya Baydar's uh, Nights of Children with Dogs, which is an eco-dystopian novel. It is, however, not that easy to categorize these texts as merely utopian or dystopian in terms of subject matter, but they have strong utopian and dystopian undertones. There may exist many other literary works which illustrate the inter- interconnection between utopia, dystopia, democracy, and alternative world systems, but I have tried to refer to some of these texts I could find. In the second part of my talk, I would like to move to the analyses of Sufi novel, The Last Island, to discuss how the manipulative democratic discourse in disguise may be a functional tool in the formation of the initial utopian order. Maybe just a brief note, Livanelli is not only an author, so he was he's a very famous singer in the country, and he had to live in exile, like in Sweden and in Greece, uh, for more than 10 years. And he produced film, he's also he's a director. He was an MP, so he's like, he has done everything, and that he has done everything quite successfully, which is I think very rare. So this picture was taken by me in London. He came to London in November, so we had the chance to go to the concert. He gave a wonderful concert with the Flarmony Orchestra in London. So he's quite active. I think he's 75 now and he values academic research a lot. So I wrote a chapter on this on the book and he just got into contact with me and like asked for the chapter because he very much wants to read like you know whatever academics write on his on his uh, canon. So Livanili's novel presents a utopian social order on a desolate island in which the rules and expectations of the mainstream ruling body do not apply. The temporal aspect is not mentioned in the novel. The island is referred to as the last voice of happiness, joy, and serenity. There are only 40 houses on the island. The owner of the island does not allow more immigration so as not to disrupt the beauty and balance of nature. They have been living in peace with the actual owners of the island, the seagulls, for a long time, reflecting the peaceful and almost egalitarian lifestyle within the human and non-human world. I think it's also not coincidental that he draws seagulls as, you know, the cover image because seagulls or, sorry, seagulls or uh, Marty in Turkish, they are the symbols of Istanbul. I don't know, for those who have been to Istanbul, like uh, they are everywhere. You always feed the seagulls, like, you know, if you take a ferry, like through the Bosphorus. So it is quite a symbolic. And I read that you also did a lot of research into the nature of seagulls, uh, like, you know, while uh, I think writing this piece. And also this piece, recent lighting last month was put on the stage in Korea, South Korea, I've been told, which is so now there are theatrical adaptations. I don't know why it has become so popular. This paradise is disrupted by the migration of the figure called the president or Bashkan, who decides to to move to the island. 
Although he states that he has immigrated to the island to maintain a peaceful life, a retired life, he begins a gradual but radical transformation of the island. He changes the nature of the island into a dystopian reality by changing, first of all, the dress code, organizing an administrative committee, and ultimately exterminating the seagulls. The ecological balance is substantially shattered, and ultimately the houses are burnt to ashes in the aftermath of his tyrannical practices. The island is reduced to ashes in the end, and the president is killed by the hunchback son of the grocer. Land ownership, competition, or the turmoil of the materialistic world would, do not exist on this island. The inhabitants manage to establish a harmonious relationship with nature and the seagulls. The president's arrival is a turning point in the history of the island, since a hierarchical order is strongly felt for the first time due to his undemocratic practices. His existence is recounted as the harbinger of doom, and the writer number seven, through his subversive discourse, plays a crucial role in reflecting the president's suppressive side. The writer becomes a token of defiance and rebellion, revealing the president's destructive nature through epistemological warfare. In time, a hierarchical level is established between him and the islanders. His first impression, as he greets the islanders, foreshadows the dystopian future of the island. The new power exercise turns out to be what regulates social life. Intervention in social and cultural life immediately ensues. Due to his staunch belief in his own divine right to rule, he begins engineering the island by ordering his men to cut the trees. This act is enough to shock the islanders, some of whom still believe that the president does not pose a threat to their island and their social life. However, the partial destruction or taming of nature is already intensified. When the islanders attempt to complain to him about depriving them of shade and the beauty of their nature and trees, they are reminded of what civilization stands for by the president, and they are made to feel as though they should apologize to him for not taming nature previously. You could see here on the slides. His, re his eloquence here reveals him as the sole figure of power and authority while lending a sense of inferiority to the islanders. When he finds out that some islanders do not agree with him, he discloses his hypocritical satisfaction regarding the difference of opinion, to which he responds by <coughs> establishing an administrative committee consisting of five members, himself, the president, his wife, number one, the writer, and another islander. Democracy, democratic discourse, and civilization at this point become key terms in persuading the islanders and transforming this island into a place that can no longer be recognized or even inhabited. His manipulative discourse enables him to exercise as much power as possible through the committee established to regulate social life. As he continues to talk about uh, civilization and arranging life, he accentuates that democracy is the presiding principle. His acts are controversial and paradoxical in that he does not actually welcome any divergence or dissidence. Thus, he wears the mask of a democratic leader, yet he is quite hypocritical. His eloquent speech is persuasive enough to convince the majority. The islanders are made to feel nationalistic and proud of their island. This gradual transformation changes the fate of the island and leads the islanders to a state of ignorance as they start believing in whatever the president says and begin to discard uh, regard the divergent figures as possible threats to the welfare of their island. After the hunchback son leaves milk, bread, and cheese on the terrace of the president, he is beaten by the president's men for violating his privacy. This act leads to the formation of certain rules by the committee. These rules imply that those who do not abide by them are to be strictly punished by the committee out of a desire to maintain public order. The formation of this comedy leads to many further restrictive decisions and movements. As time goes by, the president's hatred of seagulls starts growing as the seagulls attack his granddaughters and invade his terrace. Even though the president does not see the real figure walking on the terrace, he immediately labels the figure as a terrorist. This act causes every house and the whole island to be searched, intensifying the epistemological warfare. But the writer reveals the secret that it was only a seagull making that voice. From that moment onwards, the seagulls and the writer become the undemocratic president's deep enemies. 
Accordingly, the president finds himself at war against nature and proposes the annihilation of the seagulls. Although many islanders are initially opposed to this proposal, they finally end up exercising the annihilation of the seagulls with guns provided by the president's men. The majority are persuaded to start the fight against the seagulls. The memory of the beautiful, charming moments with these uh, with, with them is erased through the manipulative discourse of the president. His remarks and acts indicate that he does not actually believe in democracy, tolerance, equality, plurality, and diversity of voice and opinions. His conversation with number one here highlights his tyranny and his obsession with power, as you see here, equal to friendship and democracy, this all a bunch of bullshit, he says. The island goes through further experiences that accelerate the destruction of the islanders and the lost paradise. The seagulls are exterminated to some extent. Their eggs are broken. The seagulls attack the islanders in return, which makes it almost impossible to walk outside. The foxes are brought, so it's kind of also an allegorical text. The foxes are brought to, islet, to the island to annihilate the seagulls as the foxes would steal and eat the seagulls' eggs. Due to a decrease in the number of seagulls on the island, an extremely poisonous type of snake emerges. After one islander dies due to a seagull attack, another islander dies in the aftermath of a snake attack. The president thus decides to bring snake poison to fight against the snakes. However, the islanders cannot even bear the smell of the snake poison. To do away with the snake problem, a famous expert is called due to the, to the island to solve this problem. The famous expert orders the islanders to set up poles so that the storks can build nests on the poles and hunt the snakes as the storks migrate to the south at that time of the year. However, the plan fails. When it becomes clear that the seagulls are actually vital to the balance of nature, the president's plan is to reduce the number of foxes uh, and, you know, it fails. And then he actually wants to raise the number of seagulls again, which becomes a kind of vicious cycle. Cyanide is brought to the island and injected into meat left in the forest. This poison kills many other species as well and has turned the island into a death camp. As a last resort, the president suggests setting a controlled fire to make the foxes run out of the forest. The controlled fire gets out of control and causes the house and the forest to be burnt away. Of course, the president decides to leave the island and does not even feel guilty about his tyrannical practices. On the contrary, he blames the islanders for their failure. As you see here on the slide, democracy thus becomes a mere tool through which he manipulates the islanders and destroys the utopian dream. However, his despotism comes to a halt with the unexpected move of a seemingly minor character, the grocer's hunchback son. The hunchback son hits the president and they fall off a cliff together, which ends in their death. This dramatic moment inspires carnivalist laughter of the sort. The hunchback son brings the president's dream to an end. Consequently, all the islanders are chained up and put into prison. The president's heroism is praised in the end. He is buried into the cemetery of heroes and terrorists are condemned. The writer is depicted as the main figure of dissidents and because of his eloquence, rebellious remarks and his concern about the environment, freedom and utopia, he is not that much welcome there. To alienate the writer from other islanders, the president makes it public that the writer is a political convict that has escaped from prison, therefore an enemy of the regime. Subsequently, he's sent out of the island by his men and becomes a scapegoat for the president's failure. The high possibility that the writer is not dead in the end can be maybe interpreted in a positive light as well. Although the last island is ultimately destroyed, the writer, through divine justice, sympathizes with the fictional writer as the strong herald of hope. The writer's possible survival communicates hope. Livaneli's illustration here depicts the gradual disappearance and loss of such a utopian dream. Yet, Livaneli still accentuates the significance and maintenance of clinging to hope and utopian impulse in the face of a nightmarish reality through the writer's epistemological war and its struggle. Livaneli here implicates that, I quote, Another world can be built only by action, which respects the rights of others and recognizes the rights of all to essay, unquote. In conclusion, I hope I could today give you sufficient insight into utopian and dystopian narratives in contemporary Turkey, with a particular focus on utopia, dystopian, democratic discourse. 
Turkish speculative fiction has finally found its own voice in the 21st century and is now discussing crucial issues of today's world, including utopia, freedom, and democratic society. I believe that the country is a good potential for scholarly work on such <coughs> narratives. The texts I have touched on testify to an evident dystopian and or utopian vein in Turkish literature. Through these narratives, the authors are of utopian dystopian fiction, invite their readers to consider challenging problems and possible solutions at a level as relevant as the speculative fiction of other languages and nations. Thank you for listening to me. If you have any questions. Thank you for making this wonderful presentation. We still have some time left for discussion and questions, but thank you very much, but some minutes, so please. If you have any questions, we would like to start. Okay, uh, let me start then. Uh, actually, I I have a question for both of you. Um, uh, it seems to me that, that you have two different kinds of attitudes to your to your subject matter because um, on, on the one hand the, the this, this Soviet Bolshevik utopianism seems to be a bit over the top uh, in your presentation. So my, my question is how how do you actually deal with this um, uh, eccentric character of, of this uh, literature. And, uh, and the other side of the question that the government seemed to me that, that you are actually in, in, in love with this genre and this, uh, uh, these works and you, you uh, spoke about them with so much enthusiasm and here it raises the opposite question. So um, uh, did you give any thoughts uh, to how to to distantiate yourself from, from the topic to some extent in order to reflect on the diversity of the genre and, and the internal problems and so on. So uh, for both of you, uh, I have basically the same question. So what, what is your uh, relationship with, 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 your, with your subject matter? Well, um, thank you for this uh, question. It's, it's, it's a very interesting one. Uh, I yeah uh, well I I'm primarily interested uh, in this 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 kind of like contextualization uh, and the relationship between the um, like actual historic events and the literature. So for me, this this grandiose nature uh, since it's it's everywhere since uh, since it's prevalent everywhere to me does not even seem strange anymore. Register strange anymore. Um, uh, and uh, um, whenever I read uh, quotes about this, this absolutely fantastical aspirations, uh, I'm not. Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe it's uh, it's also the, the personal uh, huge uh, impact of uh, like Soviet propaganda and indoctrination where I come from. So for, for us, this this fantastical slogans. They're not. Uh, uh, they're not even. They, they don't seem that outlandish. Obviously, the with time, the the the, the meaning of their of them changes. They they become mocked, and the, all this all this uh, really uh, aspirational ideas about uh, reaching communism in like five years and stuff like this, and it's just, uh, they, they they become uh, um, almost uh, kind of. Um, like a, like a huge uh, joke, like a, a little inside joke, but um, still, I don't know, maybe it's just the, the post-Soviet upbringing uh, of mine that I'm so used to this, this ideas in general that uh, uh, I, I treat them normally and I treat them within the context because, uh, um, and that's that's the uh, actually for me, uh, I sometimes even find that uh, the, the utopian or sci-fi sci a fiction of the time is uh, somewhat even subdued next to the next to the the, the, the very uh, interesting proclamations made in political texts, for example. Uh, so um, yeah, that's that's probably 
that's how by contextualizing and like looking at this constant overlap, that's that's how uh, how I'm doing it. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Maybe just to clarify, maybe could you elaborate a little bit more on the question? So you mean my like academic relationship with the genre or? Um, I, of course, this question um, uh, was, was raised by me because uh, you you shared with us so much information about this thing, and you you on, on the other hand you went into details with this book, and and for me it was so entertaining because obviously you enjoy so much the entire topic, so. Uh, it came to my mind that um, that sometimes it's, it's very. Uh, this is not, not not a potential criticism. I'm just really curious about how you reflect on your own personal relationship with, to this to this uh, to this topic because uh, because it's obvious that you are you are uh, um, inspired by it so much on so many levels. For example, this dystopia thing, which I. Just found hilarious <laughs> the entire story mm -hmm. being funded by the government, for example. Uh, but but the the entire project is so very interesting. Uh, so so because because your your approach seems to be so com comprehensive. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I was wondering maybe there are some issues that you are more interested in, and I didn't see in the presentation oh. because the presentation was so comprehensive. Yeah, thank, thank you very much for the question and comment here. Yeah, just I wanted to clarify. Yeah, yeah, so this because this this relates to like you know contemporary like Turkey. So uh, when I prepared the presentation, I wanted to keep it more from general to the specific and then just wanted to give a kind of flavor within the time constraints, of course. But in my current project like at Boric, I am more focusing on the depictions of like um, identity and like environmental, you know, crises, how they are projected in this type of literature. And I'm analyzing from this angle. Of course, I think as someone uh, from Turkey, like it, it sometimes like makes it hard to focus on this topic because it resonates like with so many issues in the country. So in that regard, and I get like, this question like a lot from my colleagues who work in history or politics department, how if I don't find it like quite, you know, frustrating or like annoying to work on such a book because of the situation in the country, unfortunately now. Yeah, so in that regard, I mean, I think as it's a growing field in the country and like we are trying to promote this in the country through these workshops, you know, and then maybe translating like uh, certain jargon into Turkish with some other colleagues. So we, we try our best on the part. So what I try to do is like, if I am presenting it to the more international audience, I'm more giving this uh, talk on the Turkish case. And in Turkey, we are more doing these talks and maybe introducing like contemporary debates about the field rather than talking about the Turkish case. So I try to work like two ways. <coughs> I don't know if I answered your question, but. Uh, in terms of, yes, uh, of course, the, it is it is very informative for me that you are rather interested in the ecological aspects uh, when it comes to your own research. But, but still, for example, your uh, your example is, is an incredibly interesting example of the, uh, of the abuse of democracy. <laughs> yeah. uh, so it is something that we did. Yeah, question. Thank you. I have a comment and a question to both of the speakers. First to Emra, uh, this equally differentiated and democracy is bullshit for the week. That I, I made a note of this. this very <laughs> but so the question true. would be more, <laughs> more like uh, we spoke about the, the courses and research going on in Turkey. Is there enough uh, uh, academic freedom uh, or educative freedom to, to, to carry them out? Objectively, that would be the question. And to Dorina, a comment is that eugenics in the beginning of the 20th century was a commonly discussed issue uh, before the Nazis discredited it completely. Aldous Huxley comes to mind, but many other many other people were discussing eugenics. But the question, which I think secretly everyone would like to ask, is what is the sexual life of a decent Bolshevik? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, oof. uh actually uh, 
the the um, I, I I had quite quite a bit of fun of when I'm sorry if I started out. No, no. This, it gives me some time. Uh, uh, yeah. With, uh, with uh, the the twelve commandments, uh, it actually was introduced to, to me by uh, Professor Hall during uh, one of his classes, and uh, unfortunately we could not discuss it then. It was just so much fun to read this because it's uh, an incredibly interesting piece of writing that is uh, on one hand um very uh i would say feminist surprisingly well not surprisingly so because uh, the bolsheviks were trying to at least uh, present themselves as uh, the great equalizers and in this uh, the gender question as well but uh, on the other hand it's very conservative somehow because well in 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 a, in, a, in a way that we would think uh, the, the free love is the Bolsheviks were known for kind of like this. The, 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 the idea is that, that they were advocating free love and uh, like the the um, it, like the um, end goal was kind of the, the disillusionment of family as 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 we, as we know it. Uh, and uh, here, uh, the the some of the commandments were about to be chaste, uh, not uh, engaging in too much uh, sex, and just basically the idea was, uh, and, uh, you know, you have to talk to, the, so some of the ideas were quite progressive, even by modern terms, that, about that we have to talk to kids about these things early on. So it, it's, a, it's a very eclectic and interesting, and uh, I found it very hilarious, of course, because it kind of ends with this idea that, uh, uh, the, um, this, this huge rent that uh, a good proletarian would not even need to think about these things. Why would you uh, think about some basic uh, like um, the, like the things like like the, like sex drive when you can be uh, having this really uh, devoting your energy to this this really big uh, challenges of building this new society and just uh, it's just a, a very baseline instinct and it's 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 ridiculous that we don't have to talk about this that much. Uh, so uh, <laughs> the answer to this question is uh, comes from like many different sides and it's. Uh, um, <laughs> and it's quite quite a, a very fascinating, interesting topic of discussion. We, I think we've discussed it during that class as but, well. But it's curious that he doesn't intend this to be, when he has these sort of what seem like traditional moments, it's not a kind of Puritan self-abnegation. It's really about, well, okay, yes, we the sexual pleasures are wonderful. You should have them, albeit only serially, you know, monogamously, right? Yeah. Uh, but but look at these other socialist pleasures that are coming into play and we'll <laughs> embrace all of them. Don't be focused just on the sex. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank, thank you very much Joel, for this important question. Academic freedom is problematic in the country, it's no secret, but um, I think as I work for an English department, so because I was, I was teaching more like texts from the Anglophone literature, then it was fine because I never worked for a Turkish department. So that, I think that kind of gave us some security because I can always say I'm talking about Orwell, not about Turkey. And you can always find some correlations, but you know, and I think the good thing about this genre that I find is like, you know, you can always say it's not about X country, but you know, it, it was imagined. So you could always, like, I think it kind of gives that flexibility. And I mean, many of my colleagues are teaching utopia discovery related courses. I also taught a master's course in Turkish to the cultural studies program, but I didn't know how to react. Of course, then you know you discuss Orwell and you discuss, and then if a student asks you, okay, oh, can you relate it to this Turkey? And then you know, I was a bit cautious because you know, especially during the pandemic, it was like you know virtual classes. So yeah, in that sense, I think it kind of made me a little bit like nervous uh, in teaching like you know those terms. But in general, I think now <laughs> even like you know smaller universities or many universities I find like I checked the curricula of at least 50 universities and like almost all of them like they all have now like utopia dystopia courses or undergraduate level or like graduate level so I think if you for example if I taught this text I don't know how it would be because then it would be quite problematic probably mm -hmm. so it's yeah it's up to the I think instructor kind of like moderate you know where you go it's good to hear the English department gives you some freedom. That was the case in Hungary as well. Orwell was forbidden before 1990, but the English department had a copy of it. <laughs> yeah, so, so. In English, of course. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Just a very quick comment. Uh, 
uh, after having listened to the presentation, uh, I think we were reminded once again uh, what the central role animals often have in utopias and dystopias. And I don't know if you want to comment on this, or I'm interested if there has been any more uh, comprehensive studies on this topic. I think from the Turkish case, like so, uh, for this text, uh, obviously, like uh, the animals play such a big role. And I think there are some other texts, for example, this. The Garden of Forgetting, there was like animals and nature plays a big role. And like maybe recent authors also, like Oya Baydar, I think they use more animal like you know figures. So, in that sense, yes, and they play a role. And even with the rhetoric now, when people talk about utopia, dystopia, you know, animal studies or post human like you know discourses that they come into play a lot. So, now I think, especially like current scholarship, we have some colleagues. Who work on like posthumanism, transhumanism, and like animal studies, and uh, they like now exploring and analyzing, you know, the role of animals and nature, and like, like what they can tell to kind of, I think, contextualize the current like discourse. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, knowing the state in which the early Soviet Union or the Russian Empire was, right, the abject horror that was the civil war, the not, not stopping wars after that, reclamation of territories. I wonder if you could tell us exactly how much with your average Russian, former Russian imperial citizen who barely knows how to read, probably doesn't, was like, how aware were they of those narratives? So was it just something that they would see from a commissar on know, on papers a couple times and that's it? Or would they actually somewhat understand those ideas? Well, uh, that's uh, it's a good question and it has more to do with the, the Soviet uh, the propaganda machine, which kind of uh, started out with the media. And yeah, you, you mentioned the posters, which... Uh, uh, well, um, well, first of all, the, the, it's no secret that the Soviets actually made... Uh, huge and very rapid changes in educational system uh, and that, that had a very concrete uh, uh, like gain for them because indoctrination could be done so much faster this way. So um, um, I, 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 you, you started asking me this question and I immediately thought of a very prominent actually literary example of uh, Poligraf Poligrafovich uh, from uh, Bulgakov uh, who uh, if uh, um, this is a dog who can be kind of becomes anthropomorphized and becomes like a fully human uh, in the end, and uh, uh, he uh, his uh, his development uh, kind of uh, incre like incredibly fast into this uh, this parrot of uh, slogans uh, for uh, like very base baseline slogans uh, for. Uh, Soviet propaganda that uh, kind of serves as a foil to Professor Piotrzewski, an actual intellectual who created him, and uh, just uh, the I think the speed with which uh, uh, this uh, this canine human I don't know how to call him um, becomes like so entrenched into the the official um, like ideology kind of but like a very abridged version obviously. Uh, the, this indicates the the, the situation let's say from Bulgarus for a point of view, but this is the, this character is often alluded to when when talking about like the the what did the common man's proverbial so to speak. I I hate that expression, but I have time for to use it. Um, the, was the, kind of the the state of mind uh, of, at the time, and um, uh, the I mean. Uh, uh, the uh, I like the the utopian aspects of this uh, narodniki. It just it, it it kind of stems from the fact that we have to to talk and we have to understand uh, what the, the the common man is thinking. But uh, the reality was that despite uh, the best efforts of Soviets to kind of uh, like enhance this uh, this um, this processes, the, the yeah the slogans and just very like partial kind of uh, ideas that, that kind of uh, were just popularized in quick and effective ways is I think is mostly what would stick with like an actual proletariat. I mean, uh, we, we all know that like, for example, Orwell did not think very well of proletariats uh, and uh, that he, he is pretty vocal about it in 1984. 
uh, and uh, what what is the actual party treatment of them. So um, yeah, very. <laughs> I don't know if I answered your question. I, I haven't not read any like sociological uh, actual research on on public opinion um, uh, about that, but uh, that's that's as much as I can surmise uh, from, from from what I'm I don't know. Thank you very much. I may extend the question just a little bit. Okay, and if it's okay for you, then I think this will be the very last question, and the Q and A session we will be able to continue during the event. <laughs> 